Hi, welcome everyone to our webinar today, um, Nature Recovery Through Rewilding, Facts, Myths and Findings. Today we are joined by Jan Stannard. Jan is a founder trustee of the National Rewilding Charity Heal, which launched in March 2020 to raise money to buy land in England for nature recovery, climate change, climate change action and well-being. This webinar will shed light on why rewilding has inspired so many to support it. It will outline what is, um, what it is and what it isn't. Look at the difference between rewilding and traditional conservation and where those practices blur and explore the nature and variety of rewilding projects in the UK, including Keel's plan. As always, there'll be a chance for questions at the end of the presentation, so please do submit these in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation. I will ask these on your behalf later on. Thank you for logging in today and I'll now hand over to Jan. Thank you very much, Derek, and um, I'm delighted be to be here fresh from bank holiday and hope you all had a good break. Um, and I am going to go through at uh, whistle stop speed um, the um, topic area that Derek just outlined. And I hope you all find it really useful. And one of the things I think is helpful for um, an audience, whether it's this audience now or those who look at this subsequently, is to think about what, what I would like you to go away with. And I would like you to really go away with an understanding of how um, inspiring and hopeful I uh, rewilding is as a method of managing land and to really understand why it has um, uh, been such a, um, a powerful movement in recent years. But I think what's important to begin with is to think why, are, why is this a concern? And I'm sure that you will all be familiar with the background, but let's just remind ourselves of what we face. The first is the catastrophic loss of nature in this country. Um, and I haven't seen this done before, but I calculated based on the biodiversity intactness index that there are 233 countries and territories in the world whose nature is effectively in a more intact state than ours. So England, that is, where heel is active. So we have a thousand species threatened with extinction, 41% declined, and that graph uh, tells a, a really serious story. So we have a huge thing to fix in terms of species. Why have so many gone? Because we've lost so much, because we were once a quarter wetlands. I mean, I find that statistic amazing. Um, almost all our wildfire meadows have gone. Um, loss of ponds, soil health is, um, allotment soil health is um, significantly more, um, significantly better than on um, typical arable land, for example. Um, ancient woods, you all know that we've lost ancient woodland and that we have a relatively um, small amount of um, tree cover. Climate change is also something that's helped by rewilding, and I won't go through these points individually, but this summer and what's happening in Pakistan uh, all tell us that climate change is something that, that needs to be tackled on multiple fronts, and rewilding is one of those. One of the important um, understandings when one is um, getting to grips with rewilding and how it, uh, how it works is how it differs from traditional conservation. And they, they certainly overlap, but they are philosophically different. So they both help nature, traditional conservation and rewilding both help nature, but there is a, a difference of approach, which is um, um, pretty profound um, and there is a blurring. So if we think of nature conservation, it's about um, protecting what we have. Um, and it's also about um, targeting a particular species. So typically nature conservation will have um, human intervention as a, um, a fundamental element of how it is carried out. And it will have a target for what is intended for a particular area, landscape, locality. And this is a typical um, picture of a, a conservation site. So here um, there have been, uh, woodland has been opened up through the action of people and probably chainsaws. Um, so that is a site that any one of you who've been involved in conservation or uh, volunteering for conservation projects will, will be familiar with. And another one is creating habitat. So this is a, um, a field that was created to support cell buntings in Devon. That's been really successful. So there the target species was um, a cell bunting. So um, 
that is a, a really quick summary of what conservation is and has been for um, decades and decades. But there was a problem, there is a problem with that, which is that while nature conservation has been the method which is being used to look after nature, this is the uh, graph that has to be set against that. So what this tells us is that it's not enough. It's brilliant and essential and will always be essential, but it's not enough. And so what we need is more wild places where nature can thrive. And I would argue uh, managed in a different way, which is um, complementary to, but not the same as traditional conservation. So what rewilding creates is wild places run by nature, but humans are still involved. If you're somebody that feels you know rewilding really well, um, I think in your mind you, you would think this is something I can have refreshed and I may learn things. If you don't know anything about rewilding, I hope that by the end I'll have brought everybody up to that point. So I'm now going to go on and describe what rewilding is um, and I hope you find it um, valuable. Rewilding is about restoring a natural environment and it's a big picture approach. So it is um, a holistic approach rather than targeting a particular habitat or a particular species. The definition by Rewilding Britain, which is the industry association of rewilding, I would say, they do policy and campaigning and they um, visit sites and um, share knowledge and run um, rewilding groups as I'll come on to. Their definition is the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature is allowed to take care of itself. The word allowed is quite interesting because that's a, a word of human control, um, but that is the essence. So these are absolutely human constructed um, uh, areas, but the goal is that people step back and natural processes are what essentially run the site. And if one is used to conservation why, where it's very managed, that is um, quite a disconcerting thought. So that is one of the um, changes in mindset that people that run rewilding projects who come from conservation backgrounds have to um, have to change. They have to get used to the fact that control is not the goal. The Rewilding goes back to the early 1990s in, in the United States. Now, there's a lot of wilderness in the United States. There is no genuine wilderness in this country. So what's happened is that the way in which rewilding is regarded in the US has shifted in conceptually and in practice to how it's carried out in Europe. But this is still present in how it's thought about. So cause, now the original definition in the US was cause, corridors and carnivores. Now, clearly, the carnivore element, and we do have you know, badgers, for example, are carnivores, um, hedgehogs are carnivores, but we have to think this differently because we don't have top predators in, in the UK. But we are looking at core areas where nature is running with fully uh, restored ecosystems and there are corridors between those sites, ideally. And... Um, in the Lawton Review, um, which was a review of how best to restore nature, the idea of connected landscapes is really key. So in practical terms, um, a core area could be a rewilding site like those um, that will be run by Heal, and uh, the linear corridors could be um, uh, hedges or rivers or wildflower margins that are being that are put onto a farmland between these core areas. The rewilding um, in this country really started to become known when um, George Monbiot published Feral. It was known about by others, but genuinely, generally speaking, that was when it really came to the fore and it has really taken off. It's become really popular and I would put that down to hope. So what rewilding is giving people is the sense that we can um, restore nature at scale in, and, and abundance, not just species, but abundance. And I think this next slide illustrates that really well. So Rewilding Britain runs the Rewilding Network for landowners. Um, so Heal is 
an associate member because we won't have our first site until the end of this year. But this is the scale of this. And this was only set up less than two years ago. So we now have um, 19 networks around um, United Kingdom, over 112 hectares of land um, being um, rewilded using rewilding methods. And those are made up of 70, 72 projects. And um, so they are all over the country, but there is a big focus in Scotland in particular, um, and there is less happening in England. Um, it's much more scattered. And I'll come on and talk to how Heal would contribute to this. And the other thing to say is this fits within the 25 year environment plan, um, which is to return um, a significant part of, of the countryside to um, nature uh, areas so that nature has a chance to recover. What in on the ground, what does rewilding look like? Many of you may have been to the NEP estate. So NEP is K-N-E-P-P -P, and it's an estate in Sussex, which has been rewilded since the early 2000s. And I think this next uh, slide illustrates one of the um, big differences with rewilding. So that was an arable field at NEP on the left. And five years later, this is what it looked like. So visually, this is really different. And that's something that people have to adjust to. And, um, but by within five years, the biodiversity was already starting to um, recover significantly. And I'll come on shortly to talk about some of the data that NEP have collected. So having a uh, rewilding environment looks like this is, it's almost um, savannah, uh, not savannah-ish, it's almost um, from another country. Um, one of the things that you'll notice in this um, image is that trees are regenerating. I mentioned in, in the summary of this talk that to, to, to touch on uh, the difference between planting trees and rewilding. So some people think that rewilding is about planting trees. We don't think that is, nor do rewilding Britain, but there is a place for that. So the general principle is that where um, land which is going to be restored to be run by nature lacks trees, then planting trees is a really logical approach in a rewilding context. But where there are parent trees, they will be um, able to do what they do naturally, which is to um, regenerate through, usually through seeds, but not always, sometimes suckers. So that's a really important thing to understand that um, where you see the words rewilding and large scale tree planting, generally speaking, those people take a position on rewilding, which is not held by many of those involved in the um, Rewilding Britain network. So thinking about scale, so one of the words I've mentioned is the word scale, and people often ask, can I rewild my garden? So there is a definition question here, which as here we try not to become involved in because we'd rather people did something for nature and how it's defined is, and as so long as it doesn't damage what's there is important. So one of the um, things to understand is that rewilding is done, it, it's managed differently, managed in quotes differently, depending on how small the area is. So if you start on the lower right, in America where the scales are tens and tens of thousands of acres, it's managed by top predators. Now we are not in that position in this country. We tend to be the next one in, which is um, managed at scale. And I'd be talking about 250 acres and above, um, around 140 hectares and above, which is that you would have herbivores managing for you. So there are no chainsaws. There is no lopping by humans. It's done by herbivores. Um, if it's a bit smaller, you might bring those animals on and take them off again. And that's where you start to get into conservation grazing. So there is an overlap there. And if it's a, um, a small area, the intensity of the management is high because if it's in your garden, you aren't gonna have a, a, a cow or a pony in there. It's going to be the, the you that does the management. So that's the sort of very uh, top level graph about how scale works. Let's look at this idea of manage it, being managed by herbivores uh, and omnivores, if you count pigs. So these are the it's these are sometimes called the rewilding guild. So these are six species that are found in many rewilding sites. And if they're not found yet, they will be reintroduced. Um, on the top right, you have 
cows and cattle and horses who have different mechanical uh, ways of browsing the landscape and bottom right pigs who have a very different way of um, browsing and rootling and so on in the landscape. And then you have the three deer species who, who have, again, different ways of, of tackling it. But typically those would be um, the species that you might expect to find on a rewilding site that um, follows the definitions that um, Rewilding Britain have set and that here will follow. The, the guild are, typically uh, a cows like this, which are all year round, naturally fed. They'd only be fed uh, for animal welfare reasons if there was a, a prolonged free, um, freeze, for example, but they give birth naturally, they're not wormed. Um, and white park are another type of cattle that are used. Um, the next pigs I mentioned, this is a fascinating slide, which we've got we're using with NEP, all these slides are, um, are from NEP and we're using this one in particular um, to illustrate something that NEP have found. What you're seeing on this slide is an improved grassland on the left and an improved grassland on the right and an unimproved central area. And the pigs have totally focused on the unimproved area because that's where the greatest biodiversity is beneath the soil. And that is the effect of a pig. They have incredibly powerful uh, snout and they will turn the ground over, which is very, very useful for um, plants, seeds being able to um, root, for example. So they are bare earth creators and pigs are, uh, we expect to introduce pigs quite early because of this effect that they can have on, on grassland. Um, ponies are usually um, Exmoor or Conic. They're the two uh, breeds that I've seen most often. There may be others, but they are, again, as close as we can get to um, ancient species. So the cattle are um, proxies for the aurochs, which were the wild cattle that once roamed in this country, um, pigs for the boar, which are still around, and ponies for wild um, uh, horses, which once roamed. And then we have deer species like this red deer. Um, and there are issues with deer because there are so many. So naturally, the natural regeneration of trees in an area where there are a lot of deer is potentially very challenging. And so NEP, for example, have um, deer fencing to, they have deer within their project, but they, they make sure the numbers are controlled um, by the fencing. I mentioned NEP again, and it is essentially the, the poster child for rewilding because it's been going a long time and been surveyed for a long time. So let's have a look at the results. So why is rewilding convincing people as a method? Because numbers saw where land is allowed to, and, and also, things come back that are unexpected. So nobody knows what to expect and one never knows what the effects might be. But you can see from this data, which I haven't got time to go through individually, but you can see from this data that it's as extraordinary. And these gains have continued um, with the bird population, the butterfly population, bats, um, the invertebrate species and, and the soil organic carbon. So the these two slides, are uh, um, a summary of the extraordinary gains. And we've um, been in touch with other projects and we know that they're seeing similar gains. And it's all about the food web. It's all about um, insects and small mammals increasing and the uh, higher uh, level um, species then taking advantage of that and moving in. So it's, uh, uh, and if you haven't been, uh, really recommend it. The other thing to mention briefly is uh, climate change. So um, I'm keeping an eye on the time, but just to go through that quickly, rewilding helps uh, act uh, against climate change in four ways. It heals the land. So um, by being allowed to recover, the uh, plants become more resilient, the ground heals, the, the fungi and bacteria and other um, uh, microscopic um, species within the ground recover and it becomes more resilient. So plants and, um, and, and plants and animals are better able to adapt as, and it's not obviously not going to be for every um, species or type of habitat, but generally speaking, it means the land is, is healing and healthier. Um, this is the one that most people know that um, rewilding grows. So the biomass increases and therefore carbon is captured, but we've done some modeling and it's, it's clearly not the same as a tree plantation, but it is the most, um, biodiverse um, way of using a landscape. So you will end up with a mosaic of habitats 
grass will grow, scrub or shrub will grow, so hawthorn, blackthorn, wild rose and so on, brambles, and, um, and trees will regenerate, and those all capture carbon. Um, the um, protection, so by having a, uh, a site used for nature recovery is going to protect that land from other uses which would release carbon. And it prevents the large scale emissions of greenhouse gases, which would have been uh, the case had it been used in, in traditional in, or intensive agriculture. So they're the four ways. Uh, I said I'd touch on reintroductions because this is where people get particularly um, excited, certainly the general public. Um, and it, it is not an area without uh, its complexities and controversies, but let's look at some of the ones which are have been happening over the last few years. I'm sure you all know that beavers are now protected, uh, or sh will shortly be protected, and um, they have, they're have they both living wild through um, unofficial releases and also within um, enclosures in this country. And the impacts of beavers in drought conditions have been, uh, if any of you follow beavers on Twitter, you'll see that they have maintained um, wetlands during droughts. Um, beavers are ecosystem engineers that have this huge effect upon a lot more land than for a small rodent species, and they don't eat fish, which some people don't realise, but they are um, herbivores. So beavers are amazing, and you can go and see them at various projects around the country, and I um, commend it because their dams are extraordinary to see in, in the flesh, so to speak. Uh, this is a bison. Um, European bison has just been reintroduced in Kent. I'm due to go in October to see that project and they have an extraordinary effect because they rub bark off, they cause trees to fall, they open up um, woodland. So um, this small group of bison, I think it's three bison, are already having a major effect on that um, landscape in Kent. Wildcats are uh, in Scotland um, affected by domestic cats but um, are uh, currently being um, uh, bred in enclosures in the southwest and as somebody said they get called Scottish wildcats but wildcats were everywhere in the UK and there's no reason why they can't live in if the conditions are right in in the rest of um, England not just Scotland or rest of the UK not just Scotland. Storks have been been reintroduced there's evidence they were here but they were so both beavers went extinct about 400 years ago storks I think from memory similar but storks have been reintroduced very successfully by NEP and um, yeah they are they will I think gradually begin to fill our skies on a completely different scale glowworms so glowworms are being reintroduced and they are um, a threatened species so that's a, a showing that reintroductions aren't just iconic large uh, uh, creatures but also small ones um, and um, the other introduction I haven't got a slide for is the white-tailed um, eagle, the sea eagle, which has been in introduced um, in Scotland and on the Isle of Wight. Um, and um, yeah, that's a, a very impressive um, bird. And then people have plans for the Dalmatian pelican, which they want to introduce. The Somerset levels could be the first place that they are introduced. The lynx is a species that controls um, uh, deer numbers. And there is a consultation in Scotland on, on the reintroduction of the lynx at the moment. So they don't exist in the UK, but they did. So that I think we could see the reintroduction of the lynx in, in remote areas of Scotland. They're very shy. Human lynx encounters are very, very unusual. And it is um, the sheep farmers who are uh, most concerned about the impact of lynx on their um, livestock, which is part of the consultation. And the one thing that people who don't understand rewilding as in in this country say is are you introducing wolves I don't think we'll see wolves back in this country in my lifetime but maybe in some of yours if you're younger it's a, a huge subject I have no idea what will happen but wolves were once here and they are now uh, spreading and they're on the Belgian coast they're close but um, if we had Doggerland still between now to our, our nation and, and the mainland, we, they might be here, but they are not here now. And the one creature that you won't have seen in anything I've said is the sheep. And sheep were uh, are a, um, a Mesopotamian species. They are designed for hot countries. They compress the land with their um, stiletto heel type legs. 
and um, sheep graze um, grassland down to a very, very low level and tend to eat anything that's unusual in terms of flora or um, I'm not sure if they eat tree species, but um, sheep are not used on, um, well, let's say, classic rewilding um, sites for the reasons that I've given. Um, so that is the um, the essence of rewilding. So I'm going to spend my last few minutes just talking about heal. Um, we are here to raise money, buy land and rewild it. Our goal is a mid scale that's around 500 acre site in every English county, 48 sites where each site will do the things that I've been talking about, but also support the local communities and create jobs and is financially self-sufficient. Um, we are aiming to have acquired our first site by the end of this year, which we're on track to do. And a second site will be in the north, one of the four northern counties. And I've mentioned the size. We really want the site to be contiguous or close to other areas, but it depends what comes up for sale. Uh, we're looking at ecologically depleted lands. So we don't want organic farms or triple SIs or anywhere that's precious. And after 20 years in the way that NEP is, we'd expect there to be a blend of about 30, 30, 30 grassland, scrubland, woodland, and around 10% of bare land and wetland. So that's what the sites would look like. Um, the work that we do hits um, seven uh, of the sustainable de development goals um, set by the UN and also is very good on um, ESG targets for the environment. All but one of those are hit. Here is, tree, here is HEAL's um, group. So we were launched in March 2020. Uh, we've uh, got a very small team, six trustees, of which I'm one, but I also am acting CEO, my colleague Hannah. So we are two and a half people on a um, daily basis. We have a panel, a youth panel of 10, and we have well over 240 volunteers, um, and we have lots of advisors. Um, and in the time since we, we spent 18 months planning, and the time since we have uh, raising, I think we'll get to half a million donations by the end of the year. Um, we've got um, three million in lending and Triodos is providing the balance for our first site. Um, got 20 business partners um, and a mailing list, 2000. And we've done lots of webinars of which, it, which this is the latest. And our the way that anyone can be involved is to sponsor a three meter by three meter square, which is and allows us to fund that square within our site. And then uh, any sponsor is given the um, what three words address, what three words is the addressing, the global addressing system. Um, here it has animals.trees.soil. So wherever our site is, the land will be divided into squares. Um, and then um, people have that sort of connection to the land. And this is um, the uh, what we imagine a site could become. And then finally, recommended reading. Here are five books that we strongly recommend. Feral, Wilding, Rebirding. Um, uh, Rewilding by Natalie Petarelli is quite academic. And the Jepson Blythe book is wonderful um, with a big emphasis on the role of herbivores. So that's us. I think I've pretty much stopped on, finished on time. Um, we are a registered charity. Here are our details. And thank you so much for listening. Fantastic, Jen. Thank you very much. Um, we have quite a few questions, so I'll just get started. Um, the first one is, to what extent can you take a change in climate in consideration when rewilding? How easy is it to develop wild, corridor, wild corridors to allow species to move further north to remain within their climate envelope? That answer is about how people that own land decide to make that possible. We absolutely have to allow species to move north, but it depends on the species. Some can fly it, some can not. And um, for species that are hefted to their uh, place of birth, like um, amphibians or toads, I'm particularly familiar with, that becomes very difficult. So the answer is, if every landowner has corridors that connects nature rich sites, that will be a reality, that, that there is a physical connection on the ground that, that any creature can take to move between water and land. But heel can't fix that. All we can do is do our best to, and we when we look at sites that are available for sale, the choices are not great at the moment, we will try our best to be um, next to a wildlife friendly 
farming site or a site which is part of the Elms Recovery Scheme with wildlife corridors. Um, so it's for it's an answer that is from everyone, not just us. Thank you. Thank you. What are the planning constraints in allowing new Weldon programmes to succeed? The um, planning tends to be around infrastructure. So um, the land is, there are, uh, I'm not aware of um, where uh, land is um, uh, moves to a rewilding method. There isn't a, a, a planning process one has to go through. Um, that's not the same if you're planting a tree plantation because you have to apply for an, um, an impact assessment. But um, all the rewilding sites I'm aware of have simply moved to a rewilding um, approach. So the main constraint is, does the local authority support visitors going to a site if one site is there for visitors? Many rewilding sites are not. They're privately owned. They don't have access. Uh, we will. So we will um, need to go through that process each time. And clearly, that's not just infrastructure, but roads and, and, and parking and so on. So generally speaking, that's the answer. Great. Is there a minimum acreage which is suitable for rewilding? Just thinking of stocking densi densities in areas needed to support a number of animals. That's a, a really interesting question because it, it totally depends on um, how many of something that you would have. But generally speaking, um, we've chosen um, 400 acres as our minimum, I'm sorry, I don't know the hectare translation of that. I think maybe it's 120, but it's or 100. It's that sort of level, because that's the scale at which we understand that providing the natural food supply is sufficient. That um, small numbers of livestock can be left on the land all year round. So it is all about how uh, much food supply there is. So we've been told to expect um, to wait could be three, five, seven years for a site to have sufficient um, food on it for small numbers of livestock. And one pig needs 60 acres. So you that gives you an example. If you don't, if you want a pig and you don't have 60 acres, you can only have a pig on for as long as it can, uh, can, it can feed itself and is healthy. So the answer is that if it's a smaller scale, the management either needs to be done with um, livestock being brought on and off the land or by people. Um, are there any financial incentives to surrender your land to rewilding? That question is being worked through by everyone involved in the rewilding network because, and it, and it rests on what the rewilding project is set up to do. So heal projects are across a lot of different income streams where we want people to come for free to our sites to experience nature. Some sites don't have that element. So they are looking at the new environmental land management scheme that the government is introducing. How that ends up is not known fully because Things have changed a lot since that was um, uh, initially um, being planned. And the answer is yes. So I can, if, if any of you are interested in this topic, um, Savills did an extremely good um, business paper on what income could be generated by interventions that fall within a rewilding heading. It depends on your definition because they included some things that we we might not do but if for example you um, do wildflower planting or tree planting and there are a number of other things you can do so hedgerow planting we might do in some places alongside um, footpaths if we get permission planning permission for that but um, the estimate I think was around 450 to 460 pounds per hectare now that is quite a, a good rate because at the moment, farmers get basic payments plus whatever their land produces. So that is a really good question. And it will depend upon how the financial models of different rewilding projects um, turn out in the next few years, because the majority of rewilding projects have only been established in the last few years. And some are in Scotland and you couldn't necessarily translate their financial return to the south. 
So it's a complex question um, and the best basis financially is a, a wide footprint of different revenue streams, which is the approach that we're taking as a charity. Thank you. Um, questions here from Jonathan, and I've just noticed there's a follow up question, so I'll do the first part. Um, a major issue for rewilding efforts in the UK is antiquated property ownership laws, e.g., resistance by private owners of large estates, which would lend themselves ideally to rewilding. What is Hill's approach to the, land, the issue of land ownership and stakeholder approach when it comes to things like corridors between pores? If you own land, you control what happens on it. That's the essence. Some land is owned by public bodies or quasi public bodies. So universities are not public in that sense, but they're often, um, th th there is a degree of control. So if something is owned by a private landowner, it could be a huge estate. If they do not want to uh, support nature recovery in any way, there's nothing that any of us can do about it. Um, Heal is not, um, managing land or leasing land because we want nature recovery in perpetuity and um, owning land and managing what happens on it in perpetuity is is critical we think um, so the answer is you can't control it all you can try to do is the third sector which is government owned mod owned church owned um, uh, university owned those are that is a, a land um, area which where, the, where influence and lobbying and um, policy, uh, policy when policies are set, where uh, that sort of um, change can be brought about. But even large NGOs, um, so the National Trust would be a good example, they have a legacy of over 100 years and they are, they have a um, Membership, some of whom may not agree with the way that rewilding affects how land looks, for example. So it is not straightforward for um, a large landowner who have which has a legacy, which is nevertheless a charity, to change the way that it manages the land. But I've just come back from somewhere in Cornwall where the National Trust have been managing land using rewilding methods with um, cattle, and it's it, the, the biodiversity is extraordinary. So um, it's happening with pretty much all of the um, larger um, charities who are environmental charities. But the answer is you can't tell somebody what to do unless you own the land. All you can do is influence. And um, yeah, that's the that's the essentially the position on that. This is kind of similar to what Sam just talked about. So there's significant um, resistance to upland rewilding by ag agricultural bodies like the NAFU. Is it a priority order to the types of land to be rewilded? And one, is upland still a priority? And two, is there an approach to ameliorate the situation with respect to agricultural interests? The reason why upland rewild, in my opinion, the reason why upland rewilding has been, uh, see, a lot of that's been done is because the land is so inexpensive. So if you need to own it, you need to pay the money for it. And therefore um, that, you know, you, you have to, you have to be able to do that and you can do that more effectively and at a greater scale where the land is cheaper. Also some very big landowners in Scotland have moved to um, nature recovery um, management. Um, the, we are, Heal is a rewilding charity. We respect, we're all part of the food system. We respect the culture and heritage of um, farmers, whether their background is in livestock or in arable and uh, or in, in vegetable growing. And the it's so complex to go into current um, land management that and it's not something we will be dealing with that we tend not to engage in that because it isn't what we're there to do. But we understand the debates. And I think that um, if you, I didn't put it on the list, but uh, Lee Schofield has written a very good book called Wild Fell, which is about uh, rewilding in an area of traditional sheep farming and the complexity of doing that and uh, how that is navigated. And it is a, it is the most challenging area and sheep farmers 
in the uplands face the most challenging situations. So they are already subject to multiple pressures and we are really sympathetic to that. We will not be rewilding any upland areas. You need nature or cover everywhere, not just in the uplands. So we are starting in the most difficult place, which is the most expensive land, because we need bi more biodiversity in Sussex or Kent or Bedfordshire, or that's needed um, to support um, the, 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 the um, array of biodiversity across the UK. Okay, we do have quite a few more questions, but I'll just pick these. So sorry for anyone that we don't get to your question. How does rewilding view invasive species on site? Are these actively managed or accepted? We at HEAL have a, an intervention flowchart, and uh, the idea is that species are native. So if there are invasive species, so Himalayan knotweed, um, Japanese not uh, sorry Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed, which is notifiable anyway, um, those species, if they uh, are either um, have to be legally removed or are causing issues for other native plants, they would, we would go through the, uh, the intervention flowchart and remove them. So that's plant species, but that could include, um, if we had the um, signal crayfish, I think that's the right one, we would look at removing those. So I think it is a difficult decision, but we will be led by ecological um, and science-based conclusions about those because there are some native species who cause uh, sorry some non-native who cause very little issue for existing species so it is a species by species decision great and we'll finish off with this one is there a map of current site used for rewilding it would be useful to know where the projects are there is and it is on rewilding britain it's not fully comprehensive because not all rewilding is is mapped by rewilding britain but that's the best place to look so if you go on to the Rewilding Britain website and look for Rewilding Network, that maps all of the sites with little um, su with summaries, very useful summaries about where their emphases lie and so on. So I commend that to people. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Dan. Um, so that's it for us today, attendees. Thank you for logging in. I hope you found it beneficial and informative.